Music is kind of like a snake. From time to time it sheds its skin. In other words, it's always in a state of change. And that state is what the founder of Queens of the Stone Age, Joshua Hami, always tried to implement into his music. And he succeeded greatly at doing so. For every single album that he put out, he put out something new, creating a very rich and multifaceted discography that attracted fans all around the world. But where did it all start? Josh grew up in Palm Springs, California, and this place is described as one of the most boring places for a teenager to grow up. You basically had school, then you had the desert, but of course these kids found some ways to entertain themselves. They tried to skate, they did a lot of skating, and they also created music. The Palm Springs rock scene eventually grew into this very vibrant DIY movement and one of the guys who led this movement was Mario Boomer Lolly. Hami describes Boomer as one of his big inspirations and one of the big igniters to the idea that you always need to shed your skin and evolve as a musician. Hami took this piece of advice to his heart and created the sound of Caius. By asking himself what would sound different within two seconds of listening, he came up with the idea of tuning his guitar down really low and use bass amps instead of guitar amps. The sound of Caius eventually stretched far outside of its small DIY community. They got the opportunity to sign with a label, they created Blues for the Red Sun and Welcome to Sky Valley, two albums that gained so much attention that they are now seen as the pioneering modern stoner rock albums. Their music was deep, psychedelic and roaring with energy. After releasing four albums, they broke up and went separate paths. Joshua Hami started playing rhythm guitar for The Screaming Trees, after a couple of years there, he eventually created his own band, the band that we all know as Queens of the Stone Age. The Queens' self-titled debut album was released in 1998. It was a collection of riff-based hard rock songs that were layered with these quirky, dissonant, yet so addictive melodies. Many of the tracks on this record are still to this date something that I've never heard anyone else do before. They are so alien, they're so weird, so quirky in a way. I never heard anything like this before, so every time I put it on I still get surprised, I still find new things. Uh, it's a record that showcases Joshua Hami's talent for playing the guitar, for singing, and also for just crafting songs in such a great way. It's obviously a lot less heavy and more sleek and quirky compared to Kaiza's music. Um, you should definitely just check it out yourself. Now when it comes to the production and the creation of this album, Hami heavily relied on simply himself, but also drummer Alfredo Hernandez. He's a very famous figurehead in the Palm Desert rock scene. Uh, you also had Chris Goss, another very famous figurehead in this scene. He uh, played and he has a leading role in the Masters of Reality, which, by the way, is another great band you should check out. On the next Queen's record, things got a little bit more colorful. In 2000, the Queen's shed their musical skin and Rated R came to the surface. Former Caius band member Nick Oliveri joined on guitar, bass, and vocals. They also included a big colorful palette of guest musicians, Mark Lanigan, not to say the least, many others as well. And you can definitely hear this colorful collection of people in the versatile and various nature of the album. You have mesmeric, balmy and calm tracks like In The Fade and Autopilot. Then you have violent, raging efforts like Feel Good Hit of the Summer and Quick Into the Pointless. On top of that, you have these dissonant, slow-burning tracks that pushes the band's experimental boundaries. Shedding some more snakeskin, we find Queen's third album from 2002, which is called Songs for the Deaf. The main lineup of the group at this time featured Hami, Oliveri, Mark Lanigan from, again, The Screaming Trees, 
on vocals and also Dave Grohl from Nirvana and Foo Fighters on drums. I don't know about you guys, but I think that this lineup was the best lineup of Queens of the Stone Age ever. I mean, Mark Lanigan, his voice is so authentic and it just fits perfectly into the very dim and uh, dark soundscape on this album. And then Dave Grohl, again, is just, he's just doing some amazing drum work here. And uh, he's doing some vocal work in the background as well, I think. Amazing. Totally blown away. This record is, again, quite different from the previous albums that they released. Firstly, because it is vaguely a concept album. It is an album that takes the listener on a drive through the California desert landscape. How? Well, along the album you hear snippets of radio stations, both fictional and real, that are located in Southern California. It's also their longest record, and it's the album that made Queens of the Stone Age accessible and meaningful to even more people. It was the album that lifted the Queens up to be one of the most influential bands of the 2000s and onwards. Songs for the Deaf is very dark and heavy, it's discordant, but in such a harmonious and melodic way. The lyrical themes are also quite dim and gloomy. Uh, they're bringing up themes like drug use, death, depression, aggression, and breakups. Now, I just want to mention that this is the album that actually took me the longest time to like. It was a total slow burner for me. I had no idea of how I could get into this, but suddenly just one day I, wow, it just clicked and I realized how genius it was. And, and at that point I just had to discover more and more and more albums and music by the Queens. Next album is 2005's Lullabies to Paralyze. Nick Oliveri was fired at this point because of disrespect for their fans and also because he was violent towards his girlfriend. Sadly, this happened. He fits so well together with the Queens, but you know, he has always had a reputation for being a loose barrel, according to Josh Wahami. So yeah, maybe it was for the better, I don't know. Now Lullabies was not as heavy and focused as Songs for the Deaf. It had more of a versatile, dreamy feel to it. Many of the songs here also featured lyricism and titles that suggested a more fairy tale-ish theme, like Burn the Witch or Someone's in the Wolf. In an interview around that time, Hami interestingly also said this, it would have been easy to make Songs for the Deaf too which is basically all I heard in my own head. But I can't do that. You got to shake all that shit away. Over 20 years had gone by since Boomer gave advice to Hami about always changing his sound. Hami forcibly changes his musical style for every single album, just like a snake is changing its skin. So Hami is always taking risks. He sure brings about a consistency in his music despite of that. He has stated several times that he invented his own scale and playing style when he was only 13 years old. He took the famous pentatonic scale, also known as the blue scale, took pieces out of it and you know what, I, I think Joshua Hami actually describes what it sounds like a lot better than what I could. Like curtsying and shit, like yeah. I'm curtsying, I'm going... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's really lovely to meet you. There's something cabaret and stupid <laughs> about it, you know? Following the release of Lullabies to Paralyze came Era Vulgaris. This is the most mechanic rock record they've ever released at least in my opinion. Hami has always labeled Queens as robot rock, and I think this is the album that landed that term for me. Turning on the Screw, Sick Sick Sick, and I'm Designer are great examples of robot rock tracks. All the guitar riffs here are quite repetitive and mechanical, while the vocals play a more distinct role. It seems like Josh became more animated and versatile in his vocal delivery at times on this album. Maybe he compensated for the fact that he was the only vocalist on the album. Who knows? 
on all the previous albums except for the first one, he was the only singer, you know? And now maybe he felt a bit stripped down, a bit naked. Just just a theory from my side. This is a great album nonetheless. I don't think it's the best Queens of the Stone Age record, but there's certainly a lot of replay value in here. Their sound got less weird, more polished, still rough, heavy and experimental, but it had a firmer framework, it seemed like. So on Clockwork, you had standard hard rock songs like I Sat By The Ocean, If I Had A Tail, Fair Weather Friends. Then I was surprised to find ballads like The Vampire Of Time And Memory and Like Clockwork, songs that took Queens Of The Stone Age to a completely different sonic continent. I had never heard them so soft and so vulnerable before. Thirdly, you get these experimental hard rock tracks like I Appear Missing and Colopsia that added a bit of blah, blah, blah. Now back in 2009, me and a friend of mine became very very big fans of Queens of the Stone Age for the first time. So this album right here, like Clockwork, was actually the first album release of Queens of the Stone Age that we were consciously aware of. And we would continuously ask ourselves questions like, would there be equally as many collaborators and guest artists on this record as Songs for the Deaf? Would it sound anything like Era Vulgaris? Would Nick Oliveri come back on bass and vocals? Man, these questions just whimsed around in our heads all the time. And you know what really disappointed me about Like Clockwork? I just want to put it out there. Dave Grohl, Nick Oliveri, Elaine Johannes, Trent Reznor, Mark Lanigan, Alex Turner, freaking Elton John, all of these people collaborated on the record, but they all got such a small piece of the pie. I thought Elton John, a famous grandiose piano player, I thought he would play piano on track number 3 and number 10, but no, he's playing the piano on Fairweather Friends, a song that I never associate with piano. It's like laying in the background somewhere. This album is a collaborative effort in just the same way as their previous albums. Uh, but it just sounds like none of the collaborators brought anything good to the table. It doesn't seem like they got the ability to, to create something of their own and actually take over the steering. It sounds like Joshua Hami is steering this thing and really trying to control where it is going. You know what? I'm not gonna plump this album. I still think it is great. Actually, it surprised me a bit of how good it was. Uh, again, not their best one, but certainly not bad at all. This is something that I'm putting on many, many times. So as a conclusion, I just want to say that Josh Homme and the members of Queens have created some amazing albums. They never seemed to settle for any specific sound either. They always wanted to shed their musical skin and create something new. And I think that is one of the reasons why they are standing out. Maybe that's why they've never created a single bad record before. Or maybe it was just luck, I have no idea, <laughs> probably some luck in it as well. Um, but anyways, Queens of the Stone Age have created some amazing albums, I'm really looking forward to the new album, it's coming out tomorrow or today, I don't know when I will put out this video, so that's why I'm telling telling you this. But yeah, I'm gonna review that album as well, make sure to click up here if you want to check out some more of my Queens of the Stone Age related videos. If you like to share, explore and learn about rock music from Bandcamp, that is basically what I'm doing in general here, then make sure to click that red subscribe button below. Also make sure to hit that bell icon beside the subscribe button because in that way you'll always get notified when I upload new videos. <coughs> this beautiful place right here. Thank you for watching guys, hope to see you later, stay tuned, bye.